I am Lorraine de la Verpillère and I just finished my PhD in art history. Um, I wrote about visceral creativity, so the role played by, um, especially the role played by digestion and eating food in the early modern period when it comes to artistic creativity. So looking at making art and looking at art um, as engaging with the whole body, including what's happening inside, which is digestion and food eating. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Lucy Marks. I am also a PhD candidate in history of art. I just finished my second year and I'm looking at the visualization of smell in the Dutch Golden Age. So how um, the invisible is rendered visible, firstly, and when there are things that smell in works of art, what sort of meanings can be gleaned from that? So. How did you come to put the seminar series together and what were you looking to do with this series? I think I really wanted to do, uh, to try and do a seminar series uh, from the start and uh, I knew Lizzie was, had the same interest than me so we, we got in touch and we had to think about potential themes on, on, on our sides before uh, meeting together and uh, drawing a theme uh, from that and I think we we just agreed upon the, the subject of the seminar really quickly when we first met and we agreed that we, it would be the senses because we are we are both in very interested in in the topic for with I mean with our own research. Yeah, yeah. So so when we so when we first got together we we both kind of said we both agreed this is exactly what we want to look at. We happened to um, both come up with the same topic of art and the senses and um I think also we were we were very idealistic in how we wanted to structure it as well in that every single week we wanted to have a different sense and then also um, a, a paper by an artist and one from a museum and by having that structure we we tried to kind of build up yeah. the series around that. We wanted the series to be coherent and not, not just a list of, of scholars um, we wanted so each of the senses, and we wanted some um, speakers from different backgrounds, not only an academic one. So I think I think that's what we managed to achieve. Yeah. So we're used to associating sight with art, um, but how do the other senses come into come into it as art historians and also as consumers of art? Well, I can speak for eating food and and digestion, for instance, which are which are not senses that you would first think about when looking at artworks but uh, I think we had an excellent example in one of the talks of our series which was by Alison Dutch who looked at um, the relationship between gastronomy and and food in 19th century um, Paris critic and she she showed brilliantly that um, that there were links between the vocabulary of that the critics used to uh, to describe works of art and um, and the vocabulary used in the in the French kitchen so um, so, for instance, they, they, they compared Impressionist paintings with pastries and uh, their colours with ice cream. So, um, so, so it, it pointed to um, a relationship between art and, um, and this, the, the viewer that was not only about, about seeing, but also about uh, tactile apprehension um, about the colours and also uh, perhaps a... a, a um, a will to try to eat the painting, so <laughs> so it it may look more unusual, but it's um it it, it existed um as early as the nineteenth century and even as my research uh, tried to show as as early as the the early modern period, and I think then to kind of counter that way of method of researching the senses, someone like Carol Verbeek has. Um, worked not only is she researching the scents that were used by the futurists, but she's also um, interacting with the smells themselves, and she's generating smells um, so as to um, understand a little bit more about um, at what what these works of art were um, really did smell like. Um, she's she's trying to glean more. Um, through the through the sources, and I think that her kind of I think she mentioned that her first um, experience about this was um, smelling a, um, a pomander or um, or some sort of scented trinket, 
um, and realising that it, you cannot just look at something visually, but also by um, smelling it, you can gain a lot more information. Um, and then other historians are doing this as well by, by looking at, um, by smelling resins um, that are left in, in art objects um, uh, to understand the history behind these, uh, these examples and, um, and actually add another dimension to, um, to the works of art that are usually studied only visually. Yeah, even in the early more, I mean, in the early uh, earlier periods of history, we should start thinking more about the senses and how people apprehended um, the world with their senses. And I think even Lizzie has shown that. I mean, you probably heard about her uh, womb fumigation exhibition at the university library. So it shows that the people were a lot more uh, surrounded by smells than we usually think about. I mean, I mean, we, I mean, we do think about, for instance, the Middle Ages as a a period where, um, where you know, there were lots of, of uh, unpleasant smells, for instance, but uh, there were. It was actually more complicated, more com complex than that. I mean, as Izzy mentioned, there were mm -hmm. pomanders. There were. Uh, I mean, we we have to think more about what how they felt with their senses mm -hmm. and their bodies. And actually, then that reminds me as well of um, Evelyn Welsh's um, talk, and she was looking at the sense of touch, um, and the way that she was. Um, showing her research was that um, the way in which we understand the senses today is, is somewhat different um, to the Renaissance period, which is where she's especially looking, and also the early modern period, um, and saying that, you know, um, giving examples where we, we normally associate touch with um, our hands, but um, in that period, medically, it's considered to be throughout the body. Um, or other interesting things that she mentioned, um, such as um, our hair, um, so she looks at fur and, and the kind of tactility of fur and also human hair and how that is generated through um, that those are vapours that um, have dried out so they've cooled down. They're like down. excrements of the body. Exactly. Uh, they are, are like excrements there. That's yeah. how they were conceived, which is very funny when you think about it, when you're looking at very fancy uh, women in, in uh, Renaissance paintings thinking that medically they thought that hair were excrements. <laughs> yeah and so I think that by kind of dropping in these ideas and that they were they were sort of more or less um, agreed on that changes we have to know these this information in order yeah. to actually understand how the senses are understood in the past so actually our kind of our spectrum of um, speakers who are um, who, who were sort of um, exploring ideas from the Renaissance period right up to the present day were showing us how the senses had different meanings and um, perceptions in the past. Yeah, and we, we, we tried to, to make one session for each sense, but actually there were many overlaps as, we, as, the, as the seminar series unfolded, because as Lizzie mentioned, in the Renaissance, for instance, had a different vision on how the senses worked, and, uh, and for instance, taste was considered as a form of touch, so maybe not taste as we envision it today, or um, I mean, we also evoked a lot on how words can evoke smells and how it's difficult to convey those senses through words, but but sometimes it's possible. So the so all the different senses became became in in a way enmeshed in each of our speakers' talks. Yeah, and then speaking of words, um, I think that also was something that came up often was the fact that it's very hard to be able to describe all of these. Everything that we're, di we're discussing, we're so used to talking about things in visual terms, so how can we find vocabulary that describes things tactically? Ta tactically? Is that the... Yeah. <laughs> tactile? Tactile. tactile. In a, how can we describe things in a tactile way? How can we, how can we talk about... How, do, how can we harness that kind of audio vocabulary? Even um, tastes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because something that's bitter for somebody may not be for another person. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean. And I think that then that was something that was raised in our In Conversation with Caroline Campbell, who um, is head of the curators um, at the National Gallery in London. And she um, was... Um, pointed out how in the catalogue entries there isn't enough of this sort of sensory vocabulary um, and maybe it's definitely shown through the programmes that they mm. that they do um, at the gallery but um, when it comes to the text um, that is somewhat not used and implemented quite as much. Okay, excellent. Um, was there anything that particularly surprised you or gave you something new to think about that came out of the series? 
I think um, I think maybe something that we were mentioning before, but the versatility, um, or sorry, the diversity of um, the way in which you can explore the senses um, in the history of art. Um, so we could, it would be possible to um, explore it as Lorraine and I look at it um, in more sort of all, um, iconographic terms uh, where we'll see um, the senses being evidenced in imagery. However, I think that when we edge closer towards the 20th century, when art is not um, considered necessarily a purely visual medium, um, we're able to see the different senses being utilised in works of art, which is why, um, uh, well, a little bit, I mean, which is why in the 20th century you're seeing the futurists who are, or the surrealists as well, Carrie Verbeek was looking at, um, they are using, um, they are generating smells, they are generating sounds in their artworks. Um, and this is, and I think that that means then that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing, we're looking at, the senses, um, not in a purely visual way, but also um, we are interacting with artworks um, through our many other senses, not just the visual. And I think it's really, yeah, it, it's really interesting because it, it really is was well mirrored by the audience reaction during the, the sessions. Um, and they, uh, the, the, those sessions were, which were more interactive and focusing more on uh, later centuries, especially the contemporary period were, we had the uh, the chance to to smell samples and to uh, to engage directly with uh, smells and sounds. Um, uh, the there the, there was something different happening with the audience, and especially when smells were circulating around the room and people were passing samples to each other, um, you could see the atmosphere changing immediately, and that that reinforced also um, many of the speakers' comments on the senses that uh, that there's a uh, that 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 senses are a lot more communicative, and that there's something almost visceral about about those senses, and you could tell it from the reaction of our of our audience. Yeah, especially Kate McLean's uh, yeah. samples, which included lobster bait, which and canal <laughs> smell. Yeah, the smell of the canal yeah. and dinosaur smell as yeah, well. Yeah, we even smelt dinosaur or <laughs> the perceived smell of dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, really. Yeah, so such kind of instantaneous yeah. reactions that that were provoked from that. So our aim was to engage differently on the scholarly perspective, but also to engage the audience differently, and I think that I think we succeeded in that. 